Hi everyone, Matt Watson here from CarWow, and here I have a Toyota Land Cruiser, and this is the full-size one, not the smaller version we have in the UK, which is actually known as the Land Cruiser Prado. You can think of that as being a little bit like a Land Rover Discovery Sport compared to this, which will be the full big Land Rover Discovery. Obviously, I'm going to give it a jolly good reviewing, and to do that, I'm going to talk you around the design. Is this 2019 or 2009? I can't tell. Show you inside. Come to me, come to me, come on. See how practical it is. I do like a split tailgate. Oh. And of course, take it for a drive. They, oh. Now, before we get into all of that, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to turn your notifications on so you're alerted when we make a new upload. That way, you won't miss any of our awesome videos. Let's start this review by talking about the Land Cruiser's design. Now, the thing I really like about it is that it doesn't try to be anything it's not. And that is summed up by its exhaust. It has a big exhaust, but they don't surround it with showy chrome or anything. It's just there to exhaust gases from the engine. That's it. Though Toyota is still keen to promote the brand image because Land Cruiser is proudly embossed on the back. But then, to be fair, this car has quite a bit of history. First Land Cruiser went on sale in 1951. This one obviously is the V8. What is interesting is it has a roof spoiler. I'm not sure if that helps aero because if you look at this thing from the side, it's pretty much a brick. In fact, if you were to ask a 10 year old to draw a four x four off-roader, they would probably draw this. Now, interestingly, the side profile of this car hasn't really changed since 2009 because it's effectively the same thing underneath, apart from a few minor cosmetic tweaks at the front and the back. You've got some heavy duty running boards there to help you get into the car. There's a proper roof rack, not just showy lifestyle bars that you get on most modern SUVs. So you can actually put a load of luggage on the roof of this thing. It likes to just lock itself. Look, it's all right though, I've got keyless entry, so it doesn't matter. It'll only do it if your key's outside the car. Anyway, moving on, you've got some shiny trim down the sides with Land Cruiser written on them. The wheel size is 18 inches. You actually can't get anything bigger, but it does mean you end up with a lot of tire, which helps improve the comfort. As you move around the front, this thing isn't too showy, you know, it just looks purposeful because it's nice and wide. Yeah, you do have LED headlights and some chromey slats in the grill, but it doesn't shout, I've got money. I got money in the same way that a BMW X7 does, but it is a similar price. So it starts from $85,000, which is about 70,000 pounds. However, you can't buy one of these, obviously, in the UK. Here on the inside, the Land Cruiser looks really, really old fashioned. Quality is generally good though. So squidgy materials here, it's soft here, and on the dash, you've got leatherette down here, and the controls such as this, robust and solid, and the switch gear nice and damped as well. The steering wheel's lovely and chunky, though I'm not the biggest fan of the wood on it here, or the wood on the dash, once again, old fashioned. Then there's some bits that feel really cheap, like the center boss of the steering wheel, which has fake stitching. Also, the plastics here flimsy. The door handle, it's really big and chunky, but it's lightweight plastic and it feels like it belongs on a child's toy. And obviously you're going to hold that quite a bit. The front of the glove box, scratchy plastics as well, not in keeping with the car at this price. And then these switches down here, look, they even flex. That is just bizarre. What I can't fault though is the layout of the instruments. Very clear, old fashioned digital dials with a little screen in between them for various bits of information. And then in the center console, you have your climate control and your main infotainment screen. And that brings you on to this car's equipment list. The standard fit equipment list on the Land Cruiser is really impressive. So you get an infotainment system, though to be fair, it's really old fashioned. The graphics are terrible. There's not much functionality. There's not much you can do with it really. And there's no Apple CarPlay nor Android Auto. It's very, very basic. You also get a reversing camera and front parking sensors. But if you look at this, you'll see you get cameras included with a wide view, trailer view, and a 360 degree view as well, which is handy. But once again, the definition of that is terrible. You can barely see what's going on at all. It's so washed out. You get four zone climate control as well and a JBL stereo, which is banging. There's an opening sunroof, but it's not very big. You also get electrically operated front seats and they're heated and you can choose from three different temperatures and they're cooled as well. And you can choose from three different cooling temperatures. Plus you also get 
a heated steering wheel. You also get Toyota's safety sense, which includes lane departure warning, auto emergency braking with pedestrian detection, blind spot monitoring, and rear cross traffic alert to help prevent you reverse out into other cars. Finally, you get voice commands, but they're a little bit laborious to operate. Let's continue this review by talking about connectivity because there's not all that much really. Here in the front, you only get one USB port and an aux in. There is a 12 volt socket there and bizarrely, a wireless charging pad, which is quite modern, but most modern phones won't quite fit in there. So you can't shut them, which is, ah, that's a little bit annoying. I'll show you another thing that's annoying. I do like the fact that when you turn the car on, the wheel comes out to greet you. The problem is for my ideal driving position, and bear in mind, I'm someone with quite short legs. The steering wheel never quite extends far enough. So if you've got long legs, you're probably going to find it just, yeah, it's a little bit uncomfortable. You can move it up and down as well, though. But once again, the positioning just is a bit odd. Can't fault the seat itself, though. It's really comfy and fully electrical as well. And there is enough headroom if you're really tall. That's OK. In terms of cubby spaces, well, you've got door bins which are only average for an SUV. There's a couple of cup holders under here, but they're a bit shallow, so look, things just can flop around. There is a little device which you can try and grab your cup with, but it's not particularly secure. It doesn't really work very well. Under this huge centre armrest, there is a fridge. So you can cool your drink, which is lovely. And then in the glove box, there is plenty of space for lots of junk. I should probably show you this as well. Look, you've got a huge sun visor, it extends that way as well. And there's another one here, so it doesn't matter when you're driving around on a twisty road and the sun's moving about all over the place, you'll still be able to shade your eyes. Anyway, let's move on to the back seats. Welcome to the middle row of the Toyota Land Cruiser. As you can see, there's plenty of room back here. So decent headroom, decent knee room. There's plenty of foot space as well. You can slide the seats forward to give people in the very back a bit more room. Check this out, you can recline them as well. And look how far you can recline these seats. Look at that. <laughs> that is about as far as I've ever seen some seats recline in the middle row of any SUV. It's a very wide bench as well, so you can easily fit three people in this middle row. There's plenty of room, lots of shoulder space as well. And because you've got a flat floor, there's lots of space for everyone's feet as well. If you look down here, you'll see you've got your climate control buttons there and you've got heating and cooling for these back seats. Well, these ones don't get it in the middle seat, unfortunately. Also, you have your controls here for this infotainment system in the back yes now that's an optional extra and i wonder why they've got these covers on the screens maybe it's to hide the fact that the bezel's rather large or to keep it away from prying eyes of thieves like they'll never know that that's a screen worth nicking i don't know in terms of the practicality look fold this down use the armrest although look at that it's a bit weird how it flops down and then <laughs> the cup holders then just pop out you've got a useless tray there and under here some pointless storage, although it does have the control for the rear infotainment system. Yay, that's great. Now, if you want to carry longer items, you can fold down the center seat if you want to for some through loading, which is handy. If you need to carry a baby seat, well, the Icefix anchor points are under here, but that looks a bit cheap. And it's a little bit hard to actually locate the anchor points because they're hidden within the seat cushion. Kids will be very happy back here because the window sill in the back is very, very low and the rear windows, which are huge, give you a good view out. They also go all the way down. What's not so nice is the fact that you don't have much connectivity back here. So there's one 12 volt socket for charging mobile devices and a HDMI input for the rear infotainment system, but there's no USB ports. So if you've got three kids back here trying to charge their devices, mm -mm, that ain't gonna work out particularly well. You've got some extra storage here in terms of netting and the door bins, they're a decent size as well. Now let's see what the size is like in the very back of the Land Cruiser. So, to fold the seat out the way, you do that, and then ease it forward, then I can climb into the back. Right, I'm gonna pull this into position, fold this up, and now I need to move this one so you can see what the heck's going on. Oh. Right, now, I'll just put the headrest up as well. Knee room is actually okay. Headroom, if I'm sitting up straight, is tight, but if I slouch, I can get away with it. And remember, I can slide these seats forward a little bit, and the people in the middle row will still have just about enough knee room. The main problem is the fact that you're sitting really low on the floor. If you look at the angle here, it's super uncomfortable. And check this out. Do you know why that's there? That's because here in the very back, it's supposed to be a three-seater. 
I don't know who wants to sit in this middle part here though. Some very unfortunate child. That does though mean that this car is an eight seater overall, but I wouldn't want to spend too long in the back of it. I mean, yeah, you've got a couple of cup holders here and more over here and some storage here, but yet again, there's no connectivity. So if the children's mobile devices run out of battery, they're not gonna be able to charge them and they'll start kicking off. Anyway, let's move on to the boot. I will have to put this back. Now, as you'd imagine, with all three rows in place, cargo space is limited, but actually it's better than average for a seven seater SUV. It's handy that you have a split tailgate, it just makes loading easy, you can just slide things in and you could just about squeeze some soft bags in there. Now to fold down these seats, it's a bit of a process, you have to fold that down and you fold the back down and you fold this up and look, how unusual is that? They fold up sideways, just do the other one, so there we go, that, then that, then that, and there we go. You do have a big boot area, but these seats do just eat into the space. It makes it a little bit hard to pack it and get the most out of the space. Now to fold down the middle row, you have to go round to the rear doors and fold them forward. Now I've got to go all the way round to the other side. Bear with me to do the other one. There we go. And that's your total cargo area, but as you can see, and that brings me on to five annoying things about the Toyota Land Cruiser. The sunglasses holder has some really rubbish material in there, which isn't cushioning enough or soft enough for my glasses. So I'm gonna to have to put them in there in the case, which seems a little bit pointless. This is one heavy ass car. It weighs over 2.6 tons, which means it's even heavier than my daily driver AMG G63. As a result, the economy on this thing isn't great. So in the city, you're looking at 30 miles per gallon. That's US miles per gallon, by the way. Though I actually just managed 12 miles per gallon on the way here. Oops. While you can operate most of the climate control functions using these buttons, if you want to alter the fan speed exactly as you want it, you have to press this button there, then go on the screen and do it this way. Why don't they just include it down here with all the other buttons? Because the rear portion of the split tailgate isn't power operated, you can't shut the lot the press of one button like you can with a Range Rover, so you have to put this up first. And then close the top half, and boy does it take ages to shut. It's still going. Come on. That's it. The active cruise control system may use a radar to keep your safe distance from the car in front, but it disengages below 20 miles an hour, so you can't use it to shunt you along in stop-start traffic. It's not all negative though. Here's the Callway five call features. You get a full-size spare wheel, none of that tire sealant nonsense or a space saver. This means you can keep on going off-road even if you get a puncture. There's a proper old school style ratchet handbrake, which means there's less to go wrong when you head out into the wilderness. Plus you can use it to brake the rear wheels if you want to do skids or maybe help when off-roading. I don't really know, but it could be useful. The car's infotainment system has inbuilt maintenance reminders for pretty much everything you may need to maintain on the car. And there's a couple of extra ones there for personal maintenance reminders. Say if you need to go have a full body health check, I guess. This thing is a proper old school off-roader. So you've got a ladder frame chassis, which is super tough for off-roading. You've even got a rigid rear axle. Then there's the permanent four-wheel drive system, which you can switch between high gear or low gear for extra pulling power when you're going up steep slopes. There's even a crawl mode, which is like a cruise control for off-roading at really slow speeds. You can lock the differential as well, and you can even press a button, which will make it pull away in second gear for improved traction and less slip. Land Cruisers oh, have a reputation for being super durable and reliable, unlike some SUVs that come out of the same country that I'm from, naming no names. As a result, they hold their value really, really well. Engine choices on the Land Cruiser are super simple. There is just one, and that's it. It's a 5.7 litre V8 with 381 horsepower and 543 newton metres of torque. It drives all four wheels for an eight-speed automatic gearbox. Okay, let's see what the Land Cruiser is like to drive. So let's start off with the good. I love the visibility, it's really good. You've got huge door mirrors, that's nice. The seats are so very comfortable. I could go mile after mile in these things, they are lovely. The gearbox is pretty smooth and relaxing, it blurs the gears together very well. 
I also find it quite comfy. The suspension does a good job of dealing with bumps. It smooths them out. Though you can tell this is built on a proper off-roading platform with a ladder frame chassis because you get that shimmy and a shake over broken surfaces that you don't get in things like a Range Rover which have a monocoque, a far more modern construction. And that brings me on to things that aren't so good. The steering, for instance, is really heavy, vague, and it's a bit like steering a ship, this thing. And as you go around a bend, it leans and lists and lollops about. Then there's the brakes, which do nothing when you first press them. Then all of a sudden, they, oh, it's like dropping an anchor. It's generally quiet when you're cruising on the motorway, but it's just not as quiet as something like an Audi Q7. I have to say, to sum this car up, it does feel a little bit old fashioned and in need of an update. You definitely don't want to be going too quick into the corners because you could end up in a lot of trouble. It's not terrible though. You can get around. You just can't hurry it when the road's like this. Just accept what it is and that you're basically driving a car from 2009, not 2019. So then, what's my final verdict on the Toyota Land Cruiser? Should you avoid it, consider it, shortlist it, or just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should consider the Land Cruiser. It's brilliant off-road, it's super reliable and very practical. The only problem is, is that really, do you need its off-road capability? Most people won't. And for those, there's far better, more modern alternatives out there.